Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. This week we're reading uh, for the third Sunday of Advent, which falls on December 17th, 2023. Our first reading is from Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 4, and 8, verse through 11. Uh, our psalm is the 126. Our second reading is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 24. And, Caroline, you were right. We have found ourselves back in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, reading verse 6 through 8 and 19 through 28. Who knew? Third Sunday of Advent. Well, now we have a different John. So we have the John of Mark. Yes. And now John the Baptizer. And now we have the John of John, which is John not the Baptist, as I like to call him. Yes. Because he does not, he's never described that way. And he, and in fact, a careful reading of John's story of Jesus' baptism. Jesus is not baptized by John. So he has a very different role in the Gospel of John, which is a very worthwhile uh, uh, Advent theme sermon or a different way to think about what is our role during Advent and what in what ways do we actively wait or do we uh, wait with a kind of urgency or what does this waiting look like? And it's not a waiting that is, you know, kind of sitting around and and twiddling our thumbs. Uh, it, if we read and think about Advent through the lens of John, it's this, it's this witnessing or giving testimony to uh, to the presence of Jesus uh, in our midst. And so, in in this, you have the entrance of John in the prologue, of course, but then where he is specifically described as the witness who came to witness or testify to the light. He himself was not the light, but came to testify to the light. And then 19, really, if you, if you kept on reading, not that you have to, but if you read, if you read through, uh, go through 29 to 34 verses 19 through 28 are, are really the, the emphasis here is that John is not the light. Let's just be very clear about that. Mm-hmm. John is not the light. Uh, and and then 29 through 34 is his actual witness to the light. And we have the first appearance of, of Jesus outside of the prologue, of course, in the gospel in verse 29. But what's so interesting about that, so you might want to think about adding verses, I don't know, depending on what you want to do. But what's so interesting about the the act of witness or the act of testimony in in these opening verses of John is that while Jesus appears for the first time in 29 he does not speak and it is it is John's role of witness that calls attention to Jesus presence in the world and i find that to be a really interesting dynamic when we think about Advent and when we think about our call to testimony is that, uh, that there is no, you know, there, that Jesus doesn't say anything, but yet Jesus, that John says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away uh, the sin of the world and how it is our role then to point to those presences of Jesus and what we believe about Jesus uh, even even in those moments of silence. Um, so that's those are some of my first thoughts about John, not the Baptist, and Advent. How's that significant in that, right, because in the synoptics, we're, we're so familiar with the Holy Spirit coming down and there's a voice and God is the one who identifies Jesus as somebody special. Mm-hmm. And it's not even clear how much Jesus is aware of what's happening until it happened. You know, I mean, it, we, that's all speculation. But here in John's gospel, Jesus is already milling about and there is no, you know, light shining down out of heaven, a spotlight on him. But John mm-hmm. 
makes him known or reveal. Is there something we should take from that, especially at Advent? Right, that the testimony here is not otherworldly. Mm -hmm. But a fellow, a fellow human being, <laughs> I think there's something about mm -hmm. that. Is it an emphasis on the fleshness that the word has become flesh and and so then it ends up being another enfleshed human being that is john who recognizes that humanity i think there's something in that uh that that's in part what we can also give witness to when it comes to to testimony about jesus not just jesus divinity and where we see God revealing God's self uh, in the in a divine nature through Jesus, but also where we see Jesus in in absolute solidarity with humanity and what it means to be, you know, the word became flesh, not anthropos, but flesh. And does it take another human being to be able to recognize that? So I think there's that. The other thing is, I, I imagine Christological in John's gospel is that Jesus doesn't need affirmation of who he is <laughs> necessarily. I mean, it there's it really there's kind of a tension there because of of the first sign where you know it kind of it's, it's his mother who says, "Okay, this is who you are. You yeah. all you you go do what you are supposed to do." Uh, and so it's not, you know, it's not his baptism or temptation that propels him into his ministry. It's his mother saying, come on, uh, you know who you are, but, uh, but there's something about that too. And, and, and that might be a homiletical direction to take as well, that we, that we exist as Christians in that uh, maybe not necessarily that dialectic, right? That paradigm of of believing in a fully divine and fully human God, and and what is it that when is it that we favor one or the other, and why? And what are those moments where we lean toward Jesus' divinity, and what are the moments that we lead toward Jesus' humanity? And how is it that we and how is it that we hold that you know the incarnation and yet the incarnation and, and yet the resurrection and in um constant sort of existences together so those are well some of my answers to that matt and in in the sense of having a witness or someone uh somebody to give testimony it is from that that uh we recognize that um uh the spirit that the that the creator god is among us um, and what if if I if I push that to the forming of the early church, it wasn't the signs and wonders that caused people to um, say that they wanted to follow Christ. It was that the communities that were formed were so dramatically different than the communities around them. They were so hospitable. Um, and so that's what, in, in some sense, you have here, a person's life giving testimony. And then we recognize the inbreaking of the presence of God. And that, that, that holds in, that keeps both hands up as we hold in one the resurrection and in one, what did you say, the birth of, of the but life? The, yeah, the incarnation, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. The incarnation, that's what it was, yeah. I'm struck that uh, that John's gospel introduces John simply as a man sent from God when, you know, Luke spends so much time talking about his conception and, you know, Matthew, more of his preaching, Mark, not so much kind of how he dresses, but just that simple statement, a man sent from God who came as a witness to testify to the light, that there's, there's something God ordained about John something special, but like you said, his actions are are more simple in the sense that they're bearing witness. Like if he's clearly baptizing people, even though he's not the Baptist, right? In in John's gospel, but it's not like it's not as not as though his authority to create a ritual is somehow part of what it means to be God sent. But it's him bearing witness. So that's an interesting way of thinking about, you know, whom does God send to bear witness? Or how do we talk about an accurate witness being somehow an act of God in the world? 
Mm-hmm. Well, who I bears think- witness around around Advent and Christmas? Sorry, go ahead. There's no a cast and of characters. The, no, that's and of course the when the importance of John also is that John is is described as this witness and what witness then looks like gives us a model for witness and then that also becomes the primary characteristic of discipleship in the gospel of John you know that of and so it's not only John's role of pointing to Jesus but it's also John's role as giving us an example or model of what we are to do and so is there a way that we can take John's witness and do that in Advent or try that on? Or what does that, what is it about his witness that that we might attempt to do in this Advent season as a way of responding to that that call to be witnesses in the world for mm-hmm. for Jesus? And so uh that's that's yeah, that's a critical aspect of of John's role as well. I think the other th- the other important thing about that's kind of behind the scenes here, but it it also points to larger theological themes of Advent and Christmas is there's a lot, and I know I've talked about this before, but there's a lot of debate, especially in displacement theory scholarship, that John one six to eight was you know was displaced and it needs to be moved to right before nineteen and you know what is what is John the Baptist or not the Baptist <laughs> what is John doing in this you know this atemporal uh, cosmic verse story about you know prologue about about Jesus coming into being and then you know in the middle of this you're going along fine and all and that oh there's a man sent from God like. What is John doing here? But I think it really is a way that that John is reminding us that the eternal is entering into specific time and place, that the atemporal is moving into the temporal. And um, and that says something about witness as well, that that John is giving witness to a particular event and time and place of God's activity in the world. And that's also what we do that uh that we yes we can give witness to in general to who god is and who jesus is uh but at the same time this witness gets really personalized in this gospel uh with uh and i i fast forward to mary magdalene i have seen the lord oh, and, and so i have seen the lord seen not the lord. no not jesus christ has risen today you know jesus is risen he has risen hallelujah but i have seen the lord and so it's it's taking that risk to to that specificity in time of of seeing and knowing and experiencing experiencing jesus and inviting people to take on that first person witness that uh that that is called for in this gospel oh we could go on and on and on of course but isaiah (laughs) of course i could i know i don't know about you all but this is this is great yeah yeah (laughs) well yeah this is i was listening so deeply to you i forgot to 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 pull up the isaiah text this is um the language uh that uh we're familiar with because luke records these uh as um jesus uh first sermon the 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 words of 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 jesus uh as jesus is saying this is what i've i've come to do um um i cannot i i i cannot help but be struck uh uh caroline as you you made that that turn to to mary magdalene uh i have seen the lord in our previous conversation about the incarnation of a person bearing witness, uh, a, 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 a human being bearing witness to who Jesus is, and Isaiah in terms of what does that witness look like? And Matt, uh, two weeks ago, you asked, uh, who is the good news for? And Isaiah 61 I think says it, and it's 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 noted in the commentary. Uh, it is for the um, the broken. It is for uh, the the downtrodden. Um, it is for the captives. It's a powerful reminder of 
of who Jesus came for. Yeah, it's another one of those texts where you could grab any image or two out of it and yeah, and and build a, a really magnificent Advent sermon. So there's there's plenty to pluck out of here uh, mm -hmm. if if you want to, and just to you know as a whole to talk about how many basic human hopes are encapsulated here in terms of the kind of world we need in order to thrive, to survive. Uh, and so some of that, you know, connects to the Jubilee impulse that's there in the, uh, in the first verse or first two verses. Um, but even further down, right. As we talk about different kinds of ceremonies, different kinds of kind of realities in the earth, the different kinds of things in human society, and just to spend a little bit of time to think about what do we mean by human flourishing? What do we mean when we talk about peace, that shalom in the Old Testament, or the, or the kind of peace we expect Jesus to bring, and to really start to now kind of move Advent towards some of the more tangible aspects of human society that we hope to see renewed. I again, I would point people to our listeners to the commentary uh, and what Thea does with this. In particular, this could be a not that I tell my students to preach three point sermons, but uh, and a poem. We've kind of gotten away from that. But the content of the good news the prophet has been charged to deliver is summarized in the words joy, liberation, and release, which is a lot of what you were just talking about, uh, Joy and Matt, in terms of human flourishing and uh, and so and so the way in which this good news is the good news of great joy is 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 great joy and liberation and release and so that that's it I think that would be a terrific uh, mm -hmm. a terrific sermon grounded in grounded in the words and promises of Isaiah 61 the other thing which is not a sermon but I just want to call it attention to it for our listeners and that I'm going to totally steal, but I'll give credit to Thea, is that where she talks about, uh, I challenge you on this third Sunday of Advent to speak directly to the social realities of this world, that Isaiah and Jesus did not shy away from speaking to the concrete material conditions of society. Their preaching was an intervention. Mm. And I love that. Uh, you know, I'm always with, uh, with, right with our students joy of like how do you define preaching and 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 preaching has multiple purposes depending on the time and the place and the text and situation but i don't know that i've ever uh, I've, I've ever thought as preaching as intervention and yeah. so uh not that you preach that that's not what i'm saying but to just invite preachers to to think about what does it mean that preaching is intervention, especially when Advent really is an intervention. An intrusion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's an, it, it's a, it's God's intervention to redeem the world. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, there's something I think really powerful in that. So. Psalm 126, Psalm. you could do this Psalm every Sunday in Advent. I think it would work, <laughs> but. Perfect for uh, Advent three, right? Where we talk about joy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not joy more, yeah. but joy. Yeah, I would totally use this lowercase joy. J so. joy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, didn't expect that. No, that's what I would do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'd preach it. All right. Which is also using it liturgically. Yes. True. <laughs> Good point. I do. Yeah. So. Wait. Uh. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's the, the the commentary points this out. Samantha Gilmore talks about the the translation issue in the first half of it. These could be these could be future tense, and so how much does this anticipate restoration, and how much of it is a kind of acknowledgement that we've been now restored? And the best answer, of course, is well, it's both. I have to confess that as I read the commentary, um, I never thought of wanting to sing Fill My Cup, Lord, during Advent. Um, but I love the imagery uh, and the repetition um, 
uh, that she uses in terms of, you know, that God will fill their mouths, that God will fill their tongues, that their mouths will be filled with laughter um, and their tongues filled with shouts of joy. Um, and uh, I guess, Matt, I'd, 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 I'd want to preach it too. Um, and um, with following that imagery that she, she lifted up um, for this Sunday of joy. All right. Speaking of joy, you got First Thessalonians. Yeah. Very exciting. More joy, more pink candle. <laughs> always rejoice, always rejoice, always. Mm -hmm. And some people, we, we were recently in First Thessalonians at the end of uh, Ordinary Time yeah. in year A. So some people might be familiar with this. Some people might be pleased to discover that the charge at the end of a lot of worship services in some traditions comes from 1 Thessalonians 5. For those of you who are charging kinds of churches. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, because next week we'll have a benediction as well. We'll have a at the end of Romans 16. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in what way does, what is the charge of Advent, right? How is mm -hmm. it beyond just, you know, sit for a while and wonder or expect what's the what's the outward impulse mm -hmm. might be worth talking about and you know it's first Thessalonians has a good one mm -hmm. uh, the stuff that Thea talks about at the end of her commentary on Isaiah 61 is a little more specific but I, I think there are outward impulses or maybe we should call them action items that are part of Advent preaching and, and Advent celebration as well and I'll circle all the way back up, Caroline, as you uh, talk to us uh, about John and about this, um, um, uh, 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 who gives testimony, um, that uh, maybe uh, this would be the time to use the Thessalonians verse uh, that, that is the very end as a reminder, um, the one who calls you, the one who calls us is faithful and will do this.